love Steven Reese, dude. He's Yeah, that's right. Hey guys, if you're in the lobby or outside, we're going to get started here in about three minutes. So you guys can keep chatting, keep hanging out. I'm not officially starting this, but if you're in the lobby, you're outside and you can hear me. If you guys would please make your way up, uh, we're going to get started here in about three minutes. All right, guys. Uh, well, very good evening to you. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, uh, I feel very official at this amazing podium that we have put together for this. I want to thank Stephen Reese for the podium. Uh, and uh, man, welcome to the first ever uh, lecture in the Denver Lecture Series. We're really excited to kick this thing off. And uh, we, we, here, here's what we're all about around here at the Heights. Uh, we are about making disciples for the renewal of the city. We're really serious about uh, our discipleship to Jesus. And uh, we want to make holistic disciples, uh, disciples that are uh, disciples of heart, disciples of hand, but also disciples of, uh, of the head that uh, have been intellectually formed by the scriptures. And uh, we're really passionate about uh, doing that kind of formation around here. And the, the Denver Lecture Series is part of that. Uh, uh, Jonathan, one of our other pastors, uh, uh, referenced this this morning, but in the Great Commission, when Jesus gives the mission of the church, he says, uh, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he adds this second part of that, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And so the Denver Lecture Series is one of the many ways we're uh, teaching people to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. 
Uh, and we're really excited about this. Uh, I'm, 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 it's really tempting for me to introduce you, Dr. Baumberg, but Stephen's going to do that here in just a second. But I just want to say, if you're not a part of the Heights family, my name's Corbin. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're, it's our honor to host you this evening. Uh, I already met a few of you from uh, Denver Seminary and uh, different, different places from around the city, and so we're honored to host you. And uh, I personally am really excited for this evening. I'm excited to sit. I've got my notes right here, and I'm about to take so many notes. Uh, so uh, really excited for this. So I want to turn it over to Stephen. Um, and uh, Stephen is going to introduce Dr. Blomberg. And um, what, what I would say is, man, I just want to honor Stephen because this whole thing, launching this lecture series, is Stephen's brainchild. And he has put a lot of work into from building the podium to reaching out to Dr. Blomberg to building out the series for the coming year. He's done a lot of work in this. So give it up for Stephen. And Stephen's going to introduce Dr. Blomberg. Yeah, thanks, Corbin, for that. Um, like Corbin said, welcome. Uh, we've been working on this for a few months now, and it's really excited to like see faces in here um, and, and ready to be a part of this. So, um, yeah, well, welcome. My name's Stephen Reese, and uh, I'm on staff here at the Heights Church, if you don't know me. Um, we don't have that much time this evening for all the stuff we're going to try to cover, so I'm not going to repeat anything that Corbin just said, um, and I'm going to get right into it. So this evening, we're going to consider what the entirety of the Christian scriptures say about wealth, poverty, and material possessions, first through a lecture and then through a Q&A session following. Uh, throughout Dr. Blomberg's presentation, you can text any of your questions for the Q&A sec uh, Q session by texting lecture to 55498. That's up on the screen. You can text lecture to 55498. Um, if you've never been a part of our church, you'll probably get a message saying welcome to the Hyde Church. If you are, then you'll text lecture and nothing will happen. But either way, um, text your question after that. Um, and it'll go through, and we'll try to get it in before the night is over. Um, so now for our honored guest. Uh, Dr. Craig Blomberg is a globally recognized scholar of the New Testament. Dr. Blomberg joined the faculty of Denver Seminary in 1986, where he is currently the professor emeritus of New Testament. Dr. Blomberg received his Ph.D. in New Testament at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, specializing in the parables and the writings of Luke Acts. Among his many roles over the years, Dr. Blomberg has been a research fellow at Tyndale House in Cambridge, England, and was recently elected to the Executive Committee of the Evangelical Theological Society. In addition to his many journal articles and encyclopedic entries, Dr. Blomberg has edited and authored over 20 books that have been translated into languages all over the world. These include titles like Interpreting the Par Parables, Commentaries on Matthew, 1 Corinthians, and James, Jesus and the Gospels, The Reliability of the Gospels, um, and neither poverty nor riches and Christians in the age of wealth, of, of some of many. Um, a selection of a couple of these are actually available in our lobby if you're interested in purchasing any of them tonight. Um, but more than that, I personally have the extreme privilege of having Dr. Blomberg as my professor. Um, and he's an invested teacher, and his care for his students is evident from day one of class. Um, and I owe him a great debt for the way that he's deep in my love for, for scripture. So without further ado, if you just uh, give a round of applause for Dr. Craig Blomberg. Well, thank you, Steve and Corbin. And already good to see a couple of couples from churches I used to be a part of. Jeff and Heidi Messer from Bear Valley and Dan and Jess Craig from is there anybody from Mission Hills here? That was my one other church. No? Oh, rats. Okay. Um, what a nice little program. I just had printed notes. So um, you've got places to add all kinds of information if you're interested. And if you're not, that's fine. I have tried to provide enough that you have something you can take away with you. And maybe it looks nice enough that you won't just try to turn it in instantly into a paper airplane. Um, if, if you don't want it, please recycle um, rather than just wadding it up and leaving it outside. But um, hopefully you'll want to keep it. I don't know if you have ever thought of tackling a topic you were interested in biblical teaching on the way I and some helpers, my wife calls them minions, um, research assistants over the years at the seminary 
came at this book. But if you want to know the sum total of the Bible's teaching on a topic that it talks about, you can read what other people think. You can Google and or get hard copies of very thorough, detailed studies. But the only way you'll ever decide if you think they've been fair to the topic is to tackle it yourself, starting in Genesis 1.1. Just skim read the Bible and stop and slow down every time there's something on your topic. Take a few years, I suppose. <laughs> or you can cheat if you know the Bible fairly well by using all those section headings and say, right, there's nothing in this book. Um, <laughs> judges, that's just a mess. There's... Um, <laughs> Song of Solomon, yeah, not on money. Um, and then, with an enormous database, ask yourself, what are the most important passages? What do they teach? And you can write a book. And if you do a decent job, somebody will say, give us a talk. <laughs> and then you've got to shrink it down even more. I have at least three versions of these notes on my laptop. This is the longest of the three. That could be ominous. Um, my goal is to not use the entire 60 minutes they said I was given. If you've had me in class, may take that with a grain of salt, but um, it is my goal, and uh, that will leave us some time for Q&A, um, and I will not necessarily talk about every line that you see in the notes, and some of you will be happy, but let's hit some highlights and see what it adds up to. Genesis 1 two and three are the important starting point for just about any topic because God creates, he creates the universe, he creates everything including human beings perfectly good and not all religions claim that. That means the material world Money, possessions, resources, anything you use to barter with, chickens, whatever was intended to be good. Genesis 3 says we all messed up big time. No, you and I weren't there personally, but we have retraced <laughs> through both nature and nurture <laughs> both uh, voluntarily and in ways we weren't aware of, the sin of our first ancestors. And that corruption spread to the entire world, if you know the story of Genesis 3. And there are religions and there are people who don't believe that either. G.K. Chesterton, 100 years ago, once said that... Uh, the doctrine of original sin and total depravity is the most empirically verifiable doctrine in all of Christianity. I don't know how you can watch the news and not believe it. Um, but I've met people who don't believe it. But what happens after that? What happens from Genesis 4 to the end of the Old Testament? God begins a process of redemption. By chapter 12, he has focused in on one people group, the family and descendants to come of a man named Abram, who would become the uh, 
George Washington of the people of Israel, the founding father, and the first four generations, which if you went to Sunday school, hopefully somebody taught you Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Joseph, and his multicolored dream coat. No, that, that, was a, that was a musical a while back. Um, and his uh, brothers. And what's fascinating is that every one of them is blessed, every one of those generations is blessed with a foretaste of the wealth and the land and the prosperity that God wanted for humanity through Abram and his family. And not one of them gets to stay in the land permanently. And all of them are very generous with their wealth to others who have a lot less. References there, if you don't believe me. Job, who may have been from about that same time period, not always well known for the fact, as he reminds his quote-unquote friends in Job 29, How I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me. And he goes on to talk about the good days. And in verse 12, he says, because I rescued the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. Verse 15, I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame, a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. So we see two things right here at the outset. God makes wealth, and wealth can be a good blessing for human beings when they use it generously to help those who are much less well off. They languish in Egypt for 400 years. Moses arrives, let my people go. He's given the law at Mount Sinai. Ah, oh, there's nothing about money in the Ten Commandments. Not directly. But what's fascinating is the law of Moses that continues in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, sees private property as something good. Every tribe and the descendants of every tribe is given an allotment of land, in part based on their size and their need, their capabilities, their giftings. And yet, for every part of the law of Moses that stresses the good of property, there are half a dozen texts that safeguard or try to safeguard against its abuse. The sacrificial system requires unblemished, a.k.a. costly animals that you could have sold and done something good with the money, but instead it goes to the temple. Laws against charging one another interest on loans it was allowed with foreigners, but it seems that ancient Israel basically only took out loans to get out of debt. So why would you want to make it harder for one of your own kinsmen to get out of debt? Come a long way from that mentality. The Sabbath automatically meant your salary was axed by one-seventh, give or take. The sabbatical year meant that unpaid portions of loans were forgiven in the seventh year, and the jubilee year, once every 49 years in the 50th year, it was like a one-time get-out-of-jail-free card or uh, declare bankruptcy with no consequences. Any properties you had sold off in order to pay off loans reverted back to their original owner. That's not capitalism. It's 
not socialism either. It's not an approach that anybody tries in the 21st century to speak of. I love it, quote unquote. When I hear somebody waxing eloquent about the need for his, usually as his parishioners, to tithe, which by the way, the word tithe means 10%. I don't know if you knew that. I, I've never heard it mean anything else when I was a kid, but in recent years I've heard people say, well, I tithe 5%. No, you maybe give 5%, but it makes no sense to say, I give 10%, 5%. That's not the meaning of the word tithe. There were three tithes in the laws of Moses. 10% every year to go for the tabernacle and later temple upkeep and the Levites and priests who served there 10% to put on the annual festivals that Jews were commanded to follow in Jerusalem once they settled and had settled Jerusalem. And three and a third percent to go to the poor. Next time somebody quotes Malachi, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. If you can find a way, go to them privately and say, you do that? Well, yes, I do. That's so cool that you give 23 and a third percent of your income. <laughs> I bet they don't. Other laws concerned with justice for the poor. Gleaning. Leave some things in the edges of the fields for the poor. Treat the <laughs> alien, the sojourner. About the only place we use that word not for outer space is when we talk about illegal aliens. And well, maybe that is a reminder that every time there are money matters in the law of Moses, the law of Moses says treat the alien in the land exactly as you would the native born. Hmm. Wonder how that might affect our politics. Having sliding scales, those who can't afford to pay full price for something, paying less. Not taking one's livelihood as a pledge, paying wages on time, being impartial in the courts. And they get the law, and they agree to do it, and they head off, and they hear about the land and the giants in the land, and get scared to death to follow God, and so they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Not a place you would expect to find information about ongoing economic principles. And yet, Paul will quote precisely a passage out of Exodus 16 from this context When he says, verse 17, the Israelites gathered the manna, some much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone gathered just as much as they needed. This is not socialism. This is not a goal for everybody to have the same. It's not capitalism either, because there is such a thing as somebody having too much. As long as there are some who have too little. Oh, what's, what's the net figure? What's the percentage? I, I want to know where I fall. Nobody ever tells us that information. because it's a matter for our hearts and our eyes and our observation. Are we better off than many? Then we should share some of what we have. 
in Deuteronomy, God sets up, as Moses repeats and supplements the law, what actually is worked out through the rest of Old Testament history. It's a covenant that goes like this. Guys, now you have to understand, I'm from northern Illinois. In the upper Midwest, guys is the generic word for a group of people. My mother and her girlfriends talked to each other and called each other guys. Um, that's G-Y-S, not the other kind. Um, Y'all, if I were in another part of the country, to the extent that you are more obedient than not to the laws that I give you, especially as a nation, not so much individually, you will remain in the land in peace and safety and prosperity, in freedom from too many debilitating natural disasters, not always threatened to be occupied by your enemies on the borders, but to the degree that you are more disobedient than not, especially as a whole, then uh, there will be famine, there will be natural disasters, there will be enemies attacking you, there will be poverty, and in worst case scenario, there will be exile. And that is played out in the rest of the Old Testament over and over and over again. It really is the foundation for what today is sometimes called the prosperity gospel or the health wealth movement. Those folks get significant teaching from the Bible. They just fail to observe three things. One, it was a covenant with Israel and no other nation. Two, it was a covenant in the Old Testament and in no other testament, like the other one. And it was a covenant about the community and not a promise to individuals. Other than those three problems, they're on to something. But those are significant problems. I would love to have the time to just take you through the Proverbs and the Psalms and see the places where it sure looks like an individual is rewarded for their uh, godliness in, in material ways. But then you flip a page or two and you have lamenting the wicked who prosper despite their wickedness. And by the time we come to Proverbs, if somehow you manage to make it through those first 29 chapters, or the plot at times is not discernible, and before you get to the great climax about the noble wife in chapter 31 who's nothing like one segment of Christianity says women ought to be, <laughs> subservient. We get the sayings of Agur, son of Yake, about whom we know nothing else than those two names. <laughs> and in chapter 30, verses 8 and 9, Agur says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become like Jean Valjean. <laughs> I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. The prophets are full of things that Israel did wrong monetarily. You can read them there. Basically the things people do in every age of human history. Turn it into idols. Extort, rob, oppress the poor, boast in their wealth. 
charge a fixed amount for a speaking occasion. <laughs> I don't do that. I had a colleague way back in the 90s who did. We had a long, drawn out conversation. Neither of us convinced the other. What Israel must do right, seek justice for the marginalized, give generously, lament when things are wrong, seek the welfare of the city in Babylon of all places, Jeremiah says. You think Denver has a few problems? Maybe not as godly as it could be. Seek the welfare of Denver because as it prospers, you and I Next, we will prosper. And remember the goal and claim the promises about the restoration at the end of things. And then finally comes Jesus. And he says, blessed are the poor. Oh, I know Matthew has poor in spirit, but don't forget that Luke has the poor. Give to the one who begs from you. Don't let your left hand know what the right hand is doing when you give alms to help others. And then we say it regularly when we pray the Lord's Prayer, and it comes out of Proverbs 30. It comes out of that mysterious Agur, son of Yanke. Give us this day our, annual, uh, our daily bread. Don't lay up treasures on earth, but in heaven. Ah, but it also says, ask and you'll receive. Yes, it does. Matthew 7 comes one chapter after Matthew 6. You knew that. Matthew 6 is where the Lord's Prayer is found. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. But always with the caveat that it's what is God's will and not ours. Many of you will know the passage, but it bears repeating. Some people have called it Jesus' Nazareth Manifesto, hovering like a headline at the beginning of his public ministry over everything that he does when he's invited in the Nazareth synagogue to read and preach the scripture for the Saturday. And he opens the scroll of Isaiah to what we now would call chapter 61, verse 1. And he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, Luke 4, 18, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you can't say all of that is just spiritual because he did heal literally physically blind people as well as give sight to the spiritually blind. So there has to be a, a both and, which is how Luke's Beatitudes don't contradict Matthew's, both physical and spiritual dimension to every one of those promises. There's a lot in the Gospels that's taxing. Literally, taxes and tithes. What does tithe mean? Oh, yeah, 10%. <laughs> and the temple tax, the equivalent of about two days' wages per adult male Jew per year. And the tax to Rome on top of everything else. Huh. And a lot of people who said, we should not pay tax to a godless, brutal Roman regime. And even after Nero, the worst of them all in the first century came to power, Paul wrote Romans and said, pay taxes to whom taxes do revenue to whom revenue is due. Somebody once counted and said 20% of all of Jesus' teaching is on money. I think they were cheating because 
a number of parables are on money, and they're long parables, so that adds up quickly. But the math is right. Don't be like the seed, the thorns of riches and desire. Choke out the seed. Be like somebody who sold whatever was needed to get the treasure hidden in the field or the pearl of great price or who uh, did the ancient equivalent of handing your credit card to the innkeeper and said, put on it anything you want that this man needs and I'll take care of it when I come back. There are parables in which people ask for material assistance and God promises it. And there are more ominous ones, like the rich fool who in a world where somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all Israelites lived very close to the poverty level and some beneath it, you didn't have an unexpected surplus harvest and just build bigger barns. You gave a lot of that away to the poor, but this man doesn't do a lick of that. And then God says, fool, tonight your soul is required of you. And then who shall these things be? My very first year of teaching, I had a student, I'll never forget it, illustrated this by saying, you never saw a hearse pull in a U-Haul. You never saw a hearse pull in a U-Haul. My daughters say, Somebody needs to create it, take a picture, so we can say it happened. But um, make friends for yourselves, Luke 16, 9, by the mammon of unrighteousness. No, that doesn't mean ill-gotten gain. It just means money, which sooner or later is tainted because of the number of hands it passes through. Make friends for yourself so that when it fails, they, the people that you have helped bring to the Lord and disciple and train and minister to in every conceivable way will welcome you into the eternal habitations. Don't be like the rich man who had a dying beggar on his doorstep, who knew of his need, who was in a position to help, would have barely cost him anything and did Absolutely nothing. So what's your formula, Craig? Somebody says. Don't have one. I don't have one because three texts that are almost back to back to back in Luke show us there isn't one. The rich young ruler, sell all that you have, give to the poor, come and follow me. And we breathe a sigh of relief when we're reminded that's the only person in the whole Bible that was ever given that command. But, but we swallow a bit of the air that we started to breathe in relief when we come to Zacchaeus because he voluntarily gives up 50%. Yeah, that's okay too. Oh. And then we finally recognize the beginnings of proto-capitalism in the parable of the pounds where the good servants go out and invest their master's money and make more. It's a good thing to do. But the sting in the tail, T-A-L-E, is that the master asks for an accounting of everything he gave the servants. I've heard other preachers who say tithe means 10%. You give 10%, you've done your duty. Spend the other 90% in any way you like. To which there are some Greek words like skubala and perixema and perikatharta that Paul uses and they get translated euphemistically like uh, scum and dung and uh, yeah that's just full of it 
Oh, sorry, I took a couple of letters off of it. <laughs> Is this being recorded? No. Oh, well, it's not the first time I've said it. Mary anoints Jesus. Lavish. And it's good. Shut up, Judas. You don't give everything to the poor. <laughs> you didn't want to do it anyway. You just wanted it for your own coffers. But that's the special occasion. The parable of the sheep and the goats says on Judgment Day, we'll all be judged by our regular practice of feeding the hungry and giving drink to the thirsty and clothing the naked and visiting the sick and in prison and on his way to the cross Jesus said to his disciples what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their very soul and the little widow who threw in a couple of small copper coins was said to have given more than all the rich people present at the temple treasury because she gave all that she had are you seeing any patterns don't answer just think or text them to Steve. <laughs> Are you seeing any recurring themes? If, if you had to summarize in only three main points, because every speaker should have three main, well, I don't know if that's true. Um, would you have anything to put in those points? What happens if we keep going? Race into the book of Acts. All different kinds of models. Bewildering variety. Look at the first 68% of that page. Well, I'm looking at it on my notes. What does it look like in here besides better? Um, it's more than 68%. Looks more like about 77.5% roughly. Um, do know that 85.2% of all statistics are made up, right? Yeah. <laughs> Early on, there is a common treasury. On Pentecost Sunday, people say, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter and the other 11 say, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And every day they began to meet in the temple courts and from house to house, and they practiced prayer, and they listened to the apostles' teaching, and they experienced from time to time the miraculous, and they had koinonia, fellowship. You've heard of koinonia, it's that time right after the service when if there's any coffee left and all the kids haven't stolen the donuts that you stand around and don't leave right away because the Broncos aren't, well no that was back when the Broncos were good um, <laughs> some of you don't remember that but uh, <laughs> some of you do no the uh, fellowship that's described in Acts 2, that's fleshed out in Acts 3, 4, and 5, is that when somebody else in my small group, because that's what each house church was in essence, had a financial need and I could help them, I did. How are we doing? Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Joseph Barnabas. Why was he nicknamed that? Oh, he encouraged Paul. He got Paul. He turned him into the great apostle. That's not true. I mean, it's true he did that, but that happened later. He's called son of the encouragement at the end of Acts 4 because he sold a field and gave the investment to the apostles for the giving to the poor in their midst. And then Ananias and Sapphira, the first holy zapping of the New Testament. For lying about giving all 
when they didn't. Why so harsh? They seem to have been at a very vulnerable moment in the beginning of this fledgling community. Vulnerable in terms of what they did with material resources. Then along comes a new model with chapter 6, the first deacons. Hellenistic, more Greek-speaking widows being overlooked in the daily distribution. Choose from among yourselves. Delegated responsibility. Help them out. Take care of it. We see Simon the magician who is censured strongly for trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. Tabitha and Cornelius praised for giving to the poor. And then we come to a third model when the prophet Agabus comes. You know, I understand why, why some characters' names aren't used widely anymore. I know why people don't name their kids Judas. And, and some of them are just too cumbersome. Why would you call your kid Tychicus? Maybe Tick for short, but that... But Agabus is not a hard name. I think Agabus deserves more press than he gets. All right, he just shows up twice, but very significant prophecies. The first one is about a coming famine and a famine relief offering, the one that we most continue and model in today's church, special collection for a special need, and Christians sometimes give very generously. You ever think about the impact Christianity had on economics more generally? Like when that fortune-telling young woman is exorcised and her owners are bent all out of shape, but you read the fine print, it's because they couldn't use her to make money anymore. And the same thing happened when the riot at Ephesus brought everybody into the theater and they were shouting and chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and and the town clerk had to settle them down. And Demetrius was upset because, you know, this man, Paul, comes in speaking about other gods. He's defaming the great name of Artemis. And oh, by the way, nobody's buying our little silver shrines anymore. It hit them in the pocketbook. What favorite vice? <laughs> In our world, do you like to decry? And what would it take, not by boycotts or protests or legislation or anything public other than Christians in mass no longer participating in that particular vice so it couldn't make money anymore? That could be very effective then I might have to change the way I live. The letter of James gets short shrift for all kinds of reasons. Everybody likes Paul. James seems different, so nobody likes James. Well, it's still in the canon. We ought to read it and have a blast. waiting. A few more people get it. Um, <laughs> believers in humble circumstances, James 1.9, ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. The rich who? Well, it was believers in humble circumstances, presumably the rich who are believers, should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. Huh. Don't show favoritism. Don't give the best seat to the rich visitor in church and tell the poor one, here, sit under this footstool. 
everybody knows James is infamous. Well, many people know James is infamous for saying faith without works is dead. But what kind of works prompted him to say that in the second half of James 2? The answer is in verses 14 to 17. Suppose a, a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And By the way, I am all for translations that translate generic words for people in Greek and Hebrew with men and women and brothers and sisters. About the only drawback is once in a while, the Greek said brothers and sisters. And if you're used to seeing that regularly, you won't know that this is one of them. A sister is being highlighted because they were the ones most likely to be vulnerable without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, Denver Rescue Mission will take care of you. <laughs> but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it in the same way faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead? There is a, a small middle class in James who are the traveling merchants and they're not berated for their work, just that they are planning without taking the Lord's will into account. But then there are also rich oppressors, presumably non-Christian Jewish or Roman landlords who are not paying the wages or not paying them on time so that the day laborers in the smaller Jewish villages aren't always able to eat or feed their family. And many Christians reading James' response in James 5, 7 to 11 are disappointed because it sounds like all he says is be patient until the Lord's coming. God will sort it out on judgment day. But then in verse 10, he says, brothers and sisters, this time it's the generic, use guys, um, that's Philadelphia. Um, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Prophets who spoke as an example of patience. <laughs> it doesn't go together in my mind. They denounced injustice. Oh, it's true. They never took up arms. They did not promote violence revolt, only nonviolent protest, but, oh, maybe the next one's better. Job, you've heard of his perseverance. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of his complaints. It's not fair, God. And one of the most remarkable things about the book of Job that you got to persevere to the very last chapter to notice, and that's really hard in Job. Job chapter 42. You want to summarize Job's message for 41 chapters? It was, I know I'm not perfect, God, but I didn't do anything remotely so bad to deserve this. And all of his friends tried to figure out how, in fact, he did. And God says, Job 42, 7. After the Lord had spoken to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job had. Job had no knowledge of the heavenly contest that was going on from all that he knew what he said was true God was being unfair. Now, in the long run, he wasn't, but, but he didn't have that insight. Yeah, we can speak like the prophets and like Job, but that doesn't mean being quiet. And then, there's Paul. There can't be anything on money matters in Paul, can there? This is just justification by faith, sanctification by the Spirit. 
glorification in the life hereafter. How about the end of the council in Galatians 2.10, where after hashing out a detailed debate on justification by faith and not works of the law, Paul says, all the apostles asked me to do was to remember the poor, the very thing I was eagerly glad to do. Oh my goodness. There was something the early church with all those divisions and heresies and problems agreed on. Helping the poor is crucial. Just like we should do today. Not a handout for the idle. Whoever is not willing to work shall not eat. Second Thessalonians. Chew on that for a little while. All kinds of problems in 1 Corinthians, all of them to one degree or another caused by the handful of richer people. If we had time, I would unpack it. 2 Corinthians, the single longest teaching passage, two uninterrupted chapters on giving and stewardship in the New Testament, boiled down to give sacrificially, proportionally, have accountability, and there'll be rewards. No tithe, no 10%, no fixed percent. What does it take for you in your current circumstances and me and mine to be generous and at times even sacrificial? For some of us, it's a lot more than 10%. And Paul still harps on paying taxes. And jumping down to 1 Timothy, there is that marvelous passage right at the end of the book in chapter 6 that reminds us that Paul is no ascetic. First Timothy 6.10 gets often truncated. Oh, money is the root of all evil? No. The love of money is the root of all evil? No. The love of money is a root of all evil? No. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That still has a sting in it. And then the summary, beginning in 617, command those who are rich in this present world, that's most of us in this room by global standards, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. The richest reward with the least things going. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. And so there's a generosity sandwich, but in between is this wonderful little line that I muffled, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. When as my circumstances change throughout life, when I and those I am related to, family, parents, other relatives, people with deep need, church folks. When I am generous, sometimes even sacrificial in helping them out, I can't do anything I want with the remaining percent, but I can use some of it to do fun things richly for my enjoyment. That's wonderful. John can't possibly say anything on our topic. He's just the spiritual guy, right? What about 1 John 3, 16 to 18? This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister, here it's generic again, in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? The rhetorical question, the answer of it is it isn't. It can't be. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Two points from the book of Revelation, and I'm done. Almost 50 minutes. Almost unheard of. But I'm not done yet. Revelation 17 and 18 has a remarkable picture of the awful end times evil empire reminiscent of Rome in the first century that persecutes true believers. It is religiously idolatrous. It is also politically powerful, 10 kings under her orbit. It's also the wealthiest thing around. Not sure Russia qualifies, not sure it ever did even in the days of the Soviet Union. I'll let you decide for yourself where that empire might be should we be seeing any slight hints of it anywhere. But the last two chapters are marvelous. They're not a replacement for antidepressants, but almost. Read them at least monthly. Here's my summary of it. With apologies to the advertisers, you can have it all. But only on God's terms and in his timing. Are we willing to practice what in My Fair Lady in the 19th century Victorian England was called middle class morality, delayed gratification? I don't think it's anybody's morality in the 21st century. If we really believe we are going to live in a material universe, this universe perfected, recreated, it doesn't matter how many experiences I have of the wonderful things and places of this world. I've got an eternity to enjoy them and they'll be even better. Now I'm preaching to my generation because most of you are a whole lot younger. And when you retire, even though I'm trying to give new meaning to that acronym RINO so that it means retired in name only, so many databases that know my age, I would say there are days when I don't receive one, but today I got three cards. If, if I could, if I had the nerve to put up with heavy-handed sales pitches for the sake of a good meal, I could have at least four or five amazing dinners every week because of the people that want to tell me financial consulting, where my retirement home should live, what health plan to plug into, what golf course is the best. It's unbelievable. And they all go in the recycling bin. What are the three points? <laughs> what are three points that we have seen? Material possessions are good. Hallelujah. Secondly, they can be the most dangerous and insidious corrupting factors in our entire lives. Oh, those don't sound like they go together too well. How do I maximize number one and minimize number two? Point three, give a whole lot away. 
Amen. Thank you, Steve, wherever you are. Come and do whatever you're going to do. Well, thank you, Dr. Blumberg, for that and for somehow staying in our time constraints with all of that somehow. to get through. I've seen you do it before in class, so I wasn't surprised, but um, I'm just going to jump right into this. We got a lot of questions, uh, more than Will was able to, to even like put down on the sheet, but we tried to pick similar questions and put them into, um, consolidate them into, into one question um, to try to get as much as we can. So I should give really rapid answers really quickly. Right, exactly. That'd okay. be great. Um, the first question we have is, um, do you think the tithe is binding on Christians today? How does the no. old... <laughs> you didn't pick that up? <laughs> um, yeah, this is the second part of the question is, how does the old covenant relate to the new covenant in relation to money? The way it relates in everything else. Matthew five 17, I've come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law which means you got to figure out what Jesus and the apostles say about any topic and what that fulfillment means. And the way the tithe is fulfilled today is through generosity and sacrificial giving and before everybody breathes a sigh of relief, which is a sigh of relief for our homeless friends. For a lot of us in this room, we're faithful only if we're given more than 10%. Thank you. Um, second question would be that we have here is what advice would you give to somebody who has never practiced generosity before? Start <laughs> with something and set as a goal the tiniest incremental increases in the history of the world. If you can't imagine ever giving more than a dollar, do that for six months and then see if you can give a buck and a half. And maybe after a year you say, yeah, actually I could do three. And maybe after two years you could say, I'm pathetic, I could do 10. <laughs> and maybe then you get a job. <laughs> and you could try a hundred or a thousand or whatever <laughs> just uh, just start and then aim to do better thank you that was that was great um third yeah give it up that was a great answer um third question um can you speak to how couples can resolve their differences about money in a way that honors god even when they're reading the same scriptures but taking away different meanings 20 years ago, at least, back when we got something every morning at our house, it was called the Denver Post. I think it still exists online, and, and I have seen a miniature version of it in one or two elderly people's yards. Um, there was a story that said in Colorado that year, the single biggest reason for divorce was disagreement on money matters. So the first thing I would say is whatever you do, if you have to give up everything you think is one of your principles to save your marriage, save your marriage. And then get some counseling. And then slowly start to talk about these things and it's got to be compromised. And if it's that big of a deal, then neither one of you has, is going to get everything your way. And that's kind of true about everything else in marriage, <laughs> <laughs> um, which hopefully you talked about before you got married, but so many people don't. We'll keep moving. We've got a lot of these. Um, number four on my list yes. here is. <laughs> oh, not that fast. Right, okay. right. How should we think biblically about investments? Should we be wary of investing our money? Should Christians save for retirement slash kids college, retirement accounts, stock market, real estate, et cetera? Yes. Every one of those has its value. Every one of those 
can be overdone. Um, you can make bad investments. Hopefully you can make wise ones. You can invest too much. If you're not a financial type person, get good advice. Get Christian good advice or good Christian advice. Um, save for college. Help kids to the extent you can. Everybody's situation is different. There are some people who can do every one of those things all at the same time that you listed. The others are going to have to prioritize. The others are going to say, kids, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope as you've been growing up, you have seen that we're an open book with you about our finances. My parents were. Here's how much we bring in. Here's where we spend it. Um, we'd love to pay for three degrees at Stanford. We just don't have that money. <laughs> and a lot of kids can still get education through other means. Um, I'm not one of these people that says, here's a list of seven things that some people abuse, so therefore don't ever do them. Just try to learn how to do them well. Thank you. Um, Another question we got uh, that we consolidated into one was, should Christians give 100% of their tithe to the church or even giving, not necessarily even the tithe, but giving to the church, or should part of it go outside of the church and still be considered part of t a tithe? Let's just not use that word since I don't know how, how people were using it. It is perfectly appropriate to give generously to all kinds of Christian causes um, if you don't feel you can give generously to your church, first of all, because of whatever they're doing with your money that is somehow fundamentally wrong in your minds, then you need to find a different church that you can generously support. Um, but since there's no percentage that's fixed, there's no way to answer that question and keep the word tithe in it. Just say, yes, if you benefit from your church, you ought to give generously to it. And if you can't, you ought to find one you can. And then it's fine to give generously or a little bit or somewhere in between to lots of other good causes. Churches, individual churches can't do everything, especially smaller ones. Um, in which case it can be very important to support other people and organizations. Um, thank you for that. Next question here would be, how do we biblically deal with loans and debt? Can I still give to the church or to any other cause when I'm in a lot of debt? If, if you ever get to the point where you stop giving altogether, it's going to be very hard for you to ever start up again. I do not believe... Dave Ramsey has a lot of good things to say. Uh, don't always like his tone, but he's got a lot of good things to say. Um, but you got to be careful of these sometimes absolutizing things. Um, how do you teach a kid to give? You give him an allowance. You give him enough that you can encourage him to give some of it to church. And what he has is still a generous allowance, so he doesn't begrudge it. That's what you do. You're, yeah, paying off debt should be a priority, but, but never at the expense of, of giving up on stewardship. Thank you. Um, what advice would you give for someone who has more than they need? How much should they give? How much should they keep? And how much should they save? <laughs> well, John Wesley said, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can pretty good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's keep going down the list here. Um, as you mentioned in First Timothy, uh, it talks about um, sharing our money and enjoying our money. What advice do you have on how to do this faithfully, the enjoying our money part? Share first. Um, figure out if you're single. Um, 
I hope there's somebody somewhere in the world that you can talk to about this, that you can trust. If you have a family, I should say, if you're single with no one else in the world who's alive and related to you, who's a Christian and cares a whit. And there are some people like that, sadly. Um, if there are some people that fall into that category, and especially if you're married and you have a family, then it, it needs to be done jointly. No, the one-year-olds probably can't contribute much uh, to the conversation, but, you know, once they're old enough to, to take part in age-appropriate ways. Um, talk about stuff, make informed decisions, review the matter later. Well, I'm sure we just had that conversation last, that was before COVID? Oh, crumbs. <laughs> Boy, my sense of time has been warped by that pandemic. <laughs> Great. Um, next question we have here um, is, oh, there it is. Um, how can we walk the line between acknowledging God's promises about prosperity, like we talked about in some of the wisdom literature, um, the, uh, God's promises about prosperity following righteousness without falling into the errors of the prosperity gospel? When I was a young adult, I heard speakers. I heard Christian leaders, pastors, who I had every reason to trust. These were not people I just knew of from television, um, who over and over again said, if you're faithful in giving generously with your money, God will keep giving you more to give generously. And I thought, yeah, right. <sighs> That's sort of the prosperity gospel backwards. <laughs> It's happened to me, and I don't want to generalize from that and say it will happen to everybody, but it is just remarkable times when, when we have really stretched ourselves because we thought things were important to give to, and something comes my way that I had no way of predicting was going to happen that comes with a pretty generous remuneration. Um, yeah, just be generous and not irresponsible, no. Just be generous and be involved in a community where people care about you so that if you did do something a little bit too much, there are people who have your back and you've got their back. And then, yeah, then enjoy. Was that the original question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that answers it there. We've got time for um, a couple more right here. I've um, tried to be short. Yeah. Um, someone texts, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Are you familiar with George Mueller? Oh, yeah, one of my wife's heroes. <laughs> yeah, someone uh, t put in, they said, George Mueller, rather than doing anything to earn the provisions he needed to buy food and, and other things, simply prayed for God to provide food and he gave everything else away. Why shouldn't all Christians do this? How many other people have we heard of who have done that successfully? There may be others. Um, yeah, why don't we all assume that Jesus' words to the rich young ruler were for us? Um, how do you know, especially when you're studying church history, looking at some inspiring examples in lots of areas of life. How do you decide when something is, this was just an amazing person and place and time and God did this, and wow, here's a model that an awful lot of people are. The only way I know how to answer that question is to do enough study to try to determine is it something that has worked widely for lots of people in different places and times. And I'm not aware that that one ever did. And that is not to denigrate Mueller one cubit. Um, 
I just don't see it elsewhere. Thanks. Um, this is a big one. It kind of crosses money and politics, which are always, <laughs> I feel like, intertwined. <laughs> no, um, I but don't give to PACs. Right. <laughs> What, well, this, yeah, that might, that might be part of this answer. This is, what, what is the Christian obligation to advocate for biblical financial ethics in the public sphere? How should faith inform voting on ballot initiatives that affect government spending? Yeah. As citizens of a democracy, we should be involved. We should vote um, at every level. Um, we have every right and the responsibility to make informed choices about candidates, about issues, about legislation, about um, court opinions. Um, we need to be very careful that we're not um, one issue voters, that we look at the whole range of topics that the Bible is concerned about, which regularly cuts right down the middle of the Republican Democratic Party's agendas. No one's got a lock on that. It's a very difficult decision at any point uh, in time, which way you go if you're trying to be faithful to the Bible. Um, what we don't have a right or responsibility to do in this country, unless we want to undo everything that this country was founded on, is try to impose in a coercive way our values on anyone else. Um, probably have time for two more here. This one I feel like is important. We have a lot of, um, I know, business owners that are, are members here at the Heights and people in the, in the audience that are. Um, and this person simply asked, should Christian-owned businesses tithe or give from their net revenue? Is this the net versus gross question? Yeah, maybe even a bigger, uh, b more broadly, how should a Christian business owner think about generosity in terms of what they make from their business? Yeah, they should be generous. I mean, net versus gross is like talking about tithe. What do you mean? Do you 7%? I mean, just throw that stuff out. This isn't legislated any longer, so those aren't relevant questions. Just be generous, whatever that means for you, that before God, in a good conscience, you can say, I've been generous. You don't have to ask those questions. <laughs> well, I think, I think that last answer kind of answers all of them, honestly. And, uh, and that puts us right at the end of our time. Um, but thank you again for, for being here well, tonight. Thank you for having me. Any, any parting words to us on, on a, or anything else would you, you'd want to say? As in so much of the Christian life, keep the grand vision and be euphorically happy with tiny baby steps for you and others in good directions. And just keep stepping. <laughs> Thank you.
dust you made me out of the dirt you healed me out of the dark you drew me into your love and fire into your warm embrace into your light you lead me yeah you you take my life and you make it holy it's all i have so i'll give it all